town you never heard of. Hey everybody, welcome to the Common Folk Podcast with Ben, Morgan, and Andy. Andy, we're finally back, man. We sure are, and uh, we got some guests here today. Yeah, we do. Don't talk about them yet. Okay. <laughs> I want to talk about the holidays. Been busy. We've been out of the studio for like three months. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you've been kind of hard to track down and find. I mean, you've yeah. been all over the place. Yeah, it's been a been an animal. We've been spending a lot of time here, but uh, not podcasting. That's right. I mean, it feels good to get back in the saddle here, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So today we got a couple of guys in from out of town. What do you guys think about our studio? Like, you guys do this. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 similar to every studio that I've ever done a podcast. Really? In. Well, but better. Oh, okay. There we go. Since, yeah. There we go. Cool. I made sure to get the bendy mics. You did. Yeah, that's those are always These best. These are very important. Yep. Shock resistant. Yep. Yep. We don't right. get all the knocking noises and stuff. Oh, we put yeah. a lot of thought into this. You did. You yeah. got the padding on the walls and everything. Yeah. In case the guests go crazy. Yep. Yep. So uh, Zach and Randy uh, from up in Minnesota, most of the folks who listen to this will probably know these guys because we, we'll have a lot of similar audience between what, what you guys are doing and what we're doing here. When As we're recording this right now, we're not officially launched, so there's a bunch of stuff right. that will still go out. Um, we'll start picking those people up. But I think we'll have a lot of folks as well, based on some of the reach that you have too, Andy, that will have no idea, believe it or not, someone doesn't know who you guys are. Yeah. You know, and I was thinking about this, uh, you know, on the drive over here, you know, uh, for folks that don't know you guys in the millennial farmer, they might think that you just surround yourself with people that are in that world, you know, that own a tractor, that grew up on a farm, yada, yada, yada. But that's not really the case. Your guys' main listeners are just people that are curious. You know, curiosity drives people to your guys' YouTube channel, you know, trying to understand how things work, why things work. So I do, Ben, you're spot on in the the assessment that I think there's going to be an, a lot of overlap with what we bring to the table. You know, what I do in a, on, a, on a professional level as far as all of our sports broadcasting with uh, News Channel Nebraska, uh, NCN Sports Now, um, there's going to be a lot of overlap there because we attract people, I believe, that are just curious above and beyond, you know, everything else. Yeah, I think so. I think that's a lot of the appeal to, like you're saying, what what we do. And then, like, you watch Randy's stuff, and that attracts me because I don't work with what he's working with every day. And then (laughs) next thing you know, he's got stories on Instagram or TikTok where they run into a pile of trees that's 10 feet under the ground. Right. (laughs) They spend all day digging trees out of the earth. Yep. So Zach Johnson is an actual actor. Yes. (laughs) He's Uh, also a golfer. He's a golfer as well. Yep. In a separate life. Yeah, separate life. I don't talk about it much on the YouTube channel. <laughs> the uh, the millennial farmer on the socials and on the YouTubes. Um, Randy pronounced Nesman, right? Nesman, yeah. Nesman, yep. Uh, the layer of pipes. Correct. Yep. The master pipe layer. How Ooh. did you become? How did you become a master at laying pipe? Uh, like the title? I mean, just in general, or. In I general, I want to um, hear about the training. How do you become the black belt in pipeline? It's, it's a lot of practice. Yeah. No, the uh, <laughs> uh, so I started um, when I started working for these guys. They were doing some tiling on their own, mm-hmm. um, kind of small stuff, doing their own. You know, pull a few lines for a neighbor, and then uh, it just evolved from there. So, for you know the folks that are listening that don't understand um, drain tiling in farm fields, you know maybe just a quick. Explanation of <clears throat> uh, basically, we're pulling a uh, um, for the drain part is is a perforated tile, plastic tile, which is tile because back in the day it was clay. I mean, a hundred years ago they were putting this stuff in of actual pottery. Um, but basically, we're we're getting rid of the excess water. We're uh, we're allowing air and uh, oxygen to get back in the soil. Nice, and uh, so like you said, getting that that infiltration and in, and then moving water out. <clears throat> Correct. So everything's done on a grade. Um, you know, water runs downhill. Yep. So until you get your outlet, and then uh, and you got to be buried so deep so you don't hit it. So we're generally about three feet deep, and uh, laterals dump into submains, submains dump into mains, and mains dump into the ditch or whatever water source. Heads to the creek. The creek. Or the, the creek. Uh, yeah. 
A lot of wetlands. We dump into a lot of wetlands. Yeah. Yep. Creek or crick. I'm not really sure which. Crick. Is that what you're I'm team crick. <laughs> it, are they two different things? How about a stream then? Hmm. I like streams. Yeah. Yeah. Are creeks, cricks, and streams all tributaries? Someone told Ooh. me you catch trout out of one of them. I don't remember which one, though. Yeah, which one was that? That's a stream. stream. Yeah, that That's would be a, a trout stream. stream. Yeah. Okay. You never hear about a trout creek. Yeah. Would yeah. stream and brook be the same thing then? Is that what we're getting at here? Like a babbling brook? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. I know one of those. <laughs> <laughs> That's in people's backyards, isn't it? Isn't that the landscaping or something? I just know growing up in rural Nebraska, whenever I even get to Lincoln or Omaha, Nebraska, everyone's like, it's Creek, it's Creek. You can't, you got to say it right, you know. And I'm like, no, no, uh, I grew up with Crick and I'm comfortable with that. And if that's showing that, um, you, you know, my background and all that, well, I, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, you know, I've grown comfortable with, I say, the this stream of water, I pronounce that incorrectly and I'm okay. So it was like pronouns where we should we should put down how we pronounce small rivers you know it's uh it, it actually falls into the category this is a real neat little study where there's like 15 words that you can take and how do you say it like a small lobster-like creature that lives in ponds what do you call that oh yeah and uh depending on what your answer is we and if we get like five of those words we can pinpoint you you're from Georgia, or you're from the South, you're from the North, you're from Minnesota. <laughs> it's amazing how accurate that really is. I'll bet. I can believe that. What do you guys call those little animals? We, we call them crayfish. What? You call them crawfish here? Yeah. Yes. Already here, just six hours south of us? Yeah. Well, and I call them crawdaddies, crawdaddies. and I'm between yeah. you guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, I would have thought you'd have to get to Georgia before they say crawfish. I, I, I think more often here we'd say crawdad. That's what I usually say, crawdad. Yep, crawdaddies. Whoa. Yep. I would have thought only Louisiana people say crawdad. Hmm. No. Nope. No, they're crayfish. <laughs> That's only ca- Canadian people. Well, we're not that far from Canada. <laughs> Canada. <laughs> so the millennial farmer thing, Zach, uh, let's chat a little bit about that. You've done that probably a million times, but... There'll probably be a lot of folks listening here that that aren't familiar with that. So how did that come about, and and how's that going for you today? Well, it's going good. It started uh, almost six years ago now, and it was 100% to try to reach people that that don't understand what we're doing in agriculture. Because so many people have become disconnected, and that's understandable with the way the world is today. You know, I don't wake up every day and think about how to be a better accountant or a doctor or a dentist. Most, most people don't wake up and think about how to be a better farmer. Mm-hmm. But I was seeing a lot of stuff online specifically about, you know, GMOs, pesticides, drain tiles, and all the different management practices that we use where people had an idea. They understood that we were using them. They maybe even understood what those things were, but they didn't really know the full science behind it and have the whole idea and the whole picture of why we would choose to plant GMOs and use pesticides and how we actually regulate very closely how much of that pesticide we use. And we don't want to use excess fertilizer. I mean, we don't want the nitrogen, the phosphorus going into the creeks, cricks, streams, or babbling brooks any more than anybody else. (laughs) I mean, that's expensive fertilizer. We want it on our fields. So, you know, we have a real interest in taking care of the natural resources as much or more than anybody else on the planet. You know, if, if I... If I pollute the water in my community, that affects me and my family before it affects anybody else. So, I mean, we have that real personal vested interest in making sure that we're doing the right thing. And that's kind of what I wanted to bring along with some form of an entertainment value to it so that people can watch it, be entertained and enjoy it. And along with it, maybe not even knowingly, they get a little bit of that education that that helps them understand what's really going on. And are you seeing things, uh, you know, along the way and, and over the years that you've been doing this that, that tell you that you're you're achieving what your original goal was? Yeah, you know, I guess the only way to really measure that is through talking to people and seeing comments and kind of seeing where they're, you know, you can go on YouTube, you can get the analytics and you can see where the views come from. And we're getting as many views out of Atlanta and L.A. and Chicago, New York, as we are out of the rural areas. So I'm, I'm ending up talking to a lot more farmers than I thought I would in the beginning. But I'm also talking to 100 times more people than I ever thought I'd talk to. But if you look at the split, I mean, I think it's actually pretty close to 50-50 as far as, you know, talking to people involved with agriculture and talking to people that are not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's just fascinating. But you take a step back and look at it. 
I, I think that makes a lot of sense because if I'm a farmer down the road and I have an older tractor and I want to figure out a way to stretch it out, you know, not buy one this year or next year, you know, I want to talk to a guy like Ben here that does diesel tuning. You had a video on it. Well, so I want to reach out and talk to you like, did it work? You know, what went into that? Did it take two days down of, of time or, or what? So when you kind of look at it from a big picture, I guess I'm not that surprised uh, after I think about it that you're having a lot of farmers reach out to you. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not that I'm not surprised anymore because it's been that way for a while. But in the beginning, I was pretty surprised at that. And to Andy's point, I mean, you guys both and, and a lot of the folks that are doing the videos, you know, a lot of the guys that we know and we work with. Um, you guys are kind of considered the experts. Like you, you probably get, you know, whether you want to be or not, because you're putting it out there, you probably get a lot of people contacting you. Like Andy said, hey, what do you think about this? Or how did that work? Or what would you suggest here? Yeah. Yeah, we do. Or I do anyway. I'm sure Randy does too. <clears throat> right. Yeah. I just wish I could keep up with them. So I, I end sure. up not <laughs> getting back to all of them or yeah. just a quick short something or other because um, it just, just takes time. For sure. I mean, mm-hmm. I'd pick your brain for two hours about the tie-out thing because, you know, I'm big into the outdoors, duck hunting, waterfowl, all that stuff. And you hear so much on the negative side of all you're doing is taking that water and running it downhill and making it somebody else's problem. Like you're just passing the buck. Correct. You yep. took Zach's problems and you ran it on down the road, you know. Yep. And there's more to it than that. But we're a right. hot take society. And by God, that's my opinion. And that's where, that's how I'm coming at you now. Well, they add, you know, drainage is in the name. So right away, drainage, people get tense. Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, water's made for fighting and whiskey's made for drinking. So <laughs> time you're talking water, then people want to fight. That's about right. And there's a, there's a big lawsuit uh, <coughs> gearing up right now between Nebraska and Colorado. And it's all based upon the world's largest aquifer which is under Nebraska. And if it wasn't for that and us irrigating out of it, I say us, like I'm part of this Team Nebraska Pro Farming, uh, we wouldn't be in a top five producer of corn year in and year out without that irrigation. And, of course, people upstream are saying we want access to that water. People downstream are saying where'd the water go? And it's, well, it's fueling our economy. That's where it went and that's where it's going. So you it's you don't have to get too far into it to understand. Uh, How would you say that, Randy? Waters for waters, waters for fighting, whiskeys for drinking. <laughs> no doubt. I don't know. I, I've seen some people have some pretty good whiskey fights. <laughs> <laughs> mm. yeah. They need to. Uh, um, I get a lot of comments. You know, we pipe away way more water in a year than they get in a year. Mm. And uh, you know, oh man, if you could just pipe that down to us, that'd be so awesome. I mean, every direction from us is in that situation. It seems. Yeah. And here we sit, can't get rid of it. Right. I think uh, to one of the things that you were saying earlier, Andy, on the flip side of that, so there's, you know, there's this fight brewing with Colorado and Nebraska and so on and so forth. But on the flip side of that, there's also, and I haven't followed it lately, um, something going on in Iowa with the runoff and and what's coming out of the the tiles and so on and so forth and making its way to Des Moines, I believe. Blame these two right here. (laughs) (laughs) So I think there some of Randy's water goes north, so he can't he can't be half half of mine goes to Canada. Yep. (laughs) Okay. We're on we're on the continent divide. So the what continental divide. There it is. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah. Uh so yeah, just a mile north of our shop, that water goes north, uh Red River Valley and Hmm. heads heads for Canada. Yeah, but what you were talking about, uh, there's a and there's years of studies going into this uh, that there's so much runoff going into the city of uh, Des Moines. Um, their their water has too many nitrates, too much runoff uh, that farmers and producers are putting in to the water. You know, and the you're not going to stop all leaching, and that's what's going on here. You can lower the levels, you can regulate, but you're still going to have that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the taxpayers of the city of Des Moines, they're having to pay for this um, water treatment facility, and they're saying, whoa, we're not polluting our water. Uh, Zach is upstream. He should pay for it. So, yeah, water's for fighting, whiskey's for drinking. Yeah, <laughs> and, We all yeah. know cities definitely don't pollute water with the impervious yeah, surfaces right. and the sewer systems. Uh, yeah. And that's the other side of it. I think that's come out in that a little bit, too, is, uh, you know, those things that you're touching on, um, you know, the neighborhoods. The amount of fertilizers just getting oh, yeah. pounded into these front yards and, you know, all that stuff. I think we should require the homeowners that want to apply fertilizer to apply for a permit 
and then be mm. told exactly what rate of fertilizer they're <laughs> yeah. allowed, and then we track those sales, just like we would do with, with uh, restricted-use pesticides, mm. right? Mm. Correct. So yes, then they no. can go buy their Ziploc yeah. baggie, their half-gallon Ziploc bag full of fertilizer for their one-acre yard. Right. And we run, you know, a lot of us work uh, nutrient um, nutrient management plans, nutrient, yeah, correct? Yeah. 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 Um, you know, so we're a lot of us are following that and, and going by that, but then, but then, like you said, your yards. Right. Um, I know what I put on my grass. It's way more than we ever put in our fields. Yeah. 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 yeah a lot, that's what most people don't realize as homeowners. You know, they're out there, they're thinking, oh, I went and bought a bag and, you know, I put that down and that's how it's supposed to work. But if, if you actually do the math on how much of that is getting used and compare that to a thousand acres that you're Correct. fertilizing, I mean, it's just night and day different. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you don't need 400 pounds of nitrogen per acre on your lawn. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where a lot of the folks that um, raise a stink about it, but then go home to their their home that's right off of a golf course, mm-hmm. like those guys, to keep it green early and keep it green late into the season in a lot of areas, especially across the state of Nebraska, you're getting a lot of runoff. Uh, and a lot of uh, these golf courses have water features or, you know, a nice little babbling b- brook or a creek that runs mm-hmm. through it. Um, and <coughs> That's producing a heck of a lot more of what, you know, the city of Des Moines or whoever else is out there complaining about these uh, chemical runoffs than farmers. And, Randy, to your point, most farmers, most of us are out there trying to stretch it even further. If there's a way we can save a dollar per acre or half a dollar per acre on less product, by God, we're going to do it. You you know what I mean? Right. Yep. We're not just throwing it out there uh, Mm -hmm. to use what we use and let the rest run away. I mean, uh, it's an expensive it's an yeah. expensive product that we use. Yeah, it really is. And you're trying to stretch it and manage that. For sure. Yep, it's got to be, it has to be managed properly. And again, that's what a lot of people don't realize. And expensive, I mean, shoot, again, I don't know when this is going to come out, but you, I'm sure you guys are running through this. We just took a phone call about it yeah. 10 minutes ago yeah. from a guy from Canada that called the shop on uh, what's happening with pricing on, on those inputs right now. It's ridiculous. Oh, it's just nuts. I mean, fertilizer yeah. is... More than doubled right now from where it was. Almost three times. Yeah, which is crazy. I was just going to say, where does that start, though? I mean, right? Like, who sets these prices? Starts with corn prices. I think so. I mean, I think a lot of it is that, the supply and demand and the corn prices being up and fertilizer companies knowing they can charge more because the farmers will have that income coming in. And then it's real easy to blame COVID and labor shortages and you know, supply shortages and you can't get it there as easy and the logistics. I mean, you can blame whatever you want at this point. Oh, yeah. Some of it is the uh, the Olympics is in China again in how many, <laughs> two years. That's serious. <laughs> that, that, well, that they, have to, what? they have to clean up their air. That's why Roundup's, Roundup's up uh, four times right oh, now. Oh, so they're not producing it <clears throat> because of that. Yeah, same thing oh, happened okay. last time the, Ch- okay. the Olympics was by and they got to clean up the air to get the Olympics there. Mm. So but really, they, they're just playing games. Yeah. So they just shut down the factories yeah. that are causing the most pollution and then and then uh let it go through and then refire everything back up yeah. some of the prices that i'm hearing like i don't honestly know how a lot of guys are gonna do it this year we're gonna put roundup in a, a direct injection tank so we're, we're not gonna we're not gonna use it everywhere yep um, like you normally would off. yep yep and i know we, we're gonna use a lot less roundup because we went with the um uh what are the the two four d beans okay not extend but uh not extend, not the liberty. Cambo stuff. No, nope. not that. I can't think of the name. Anyway, we switched. We switched our chemistry program up just for a lot of it for that mm-hmm. reason. Do you guys think that uh, based on what you're doing there, that it's uh, what what you're going to be doing is sustainable, or are you just like going to take a hit in hopes that you can go back to what you used to be doing once prices come back down? You know, and when I say take a hit, I mean uh, in terms of your weed control or you know crop production or whatever. I, th- I think, I mean, every, everything will pencil out still, um, or pretty close, but there's no, there's not going to be any extra left, you know, from when we're at, what, $3 corn to right. now, to now if we're at 6 or 6 mm-hmm. fifty corn, I don't, our profit margin isn't going to change any, mm-hmm. um, I think. But when you're yeah. changing the, me- like the method you're talking about that you're changing is ultimately <clears throat> going to b- result in you being able to use less, right? Well, it, and we always are kind of changing our uh-huh. chemistry around, um, but, uh. But yeah, it it could. I mean, we we could start seeing, you know, some weed pressure. Yeah. In the next few years, if we're if we're not quite taking care of them this year. And it seems like guys, you know, you you do a really good job year after year after year, of of doing that. 
And then you can almost kind of have like a buffer year where you're not going to be affected as much if you don't hit it as hard as you used to, but then that's going to come back quick. Right. Yep. I mean, uh, um, you can take over a farm for someone that hadn't had good weed control and you'll, I mean, you'll fight that through oh, yeah. five, six years yeah. trying to get that clean back up to, to where it's at. And For the layman out there, a guy that doesn't farm every day or has been at it for very long, I mean, there's a very basic point that everyone can understand, and that's if you use less fertilizer, you're going to have less of a bushel. So that means less corn, less soybeans to work with and, and to market and to sell. So, I mean, that's that's the curious part for me is, okay, I mean, if you drop from 90 beans per bushel to 60, I mean, how is that not going to affect your bottom line? I mean, I get it. You're using less fertilizer, but since the fertilizer costs more, I mean, that might be right in line. So I, I just... Just not knowing a whole lot about it, I'm just thinking your guys' margins, farmers across the nation, are really going to have a tough time uh, figuring it out this next year or two. Yeah, that's always kind of a, a difficult balance. You know, like when you're talking fertilizer specifically, especially on nitrogen, the universities have shown over and over again that there's a sweet spot for nitrogen. I mean, depending mm-hmm. on what you're going to grow, which there again, it's tough to know you're going to grow you know, like in our area, are we going to have 220 bushel corn this year? Or is it going to be 160? Well, it, you don't know that until Mother Nature gives you what it gives you. But trying to find that sweet spot on nitrogen where the return on the money you spend on it is maximized, and anything above that, you might be adding to your yield, but the return on investment isn't as, as good. And that that's the delicate balance that you got to try to find every year. Yeah, I think a lot of guys spend a lot of time going through those... those uh well, profit margins basically right, right. going through and and uh if we cut here and add here you know what's it going to do you know what's our ROI at the end of the day hmm that's interesting you could talk about that for a long time <laughs> yeah <laughs> you really could yeah <laughs> and what goes into it yep so uh you guys have been down here a couple of days now right Came yep. down yep yesterday what do you guys think of uh Nebraska and the area this area is a lot more rolling than I thought. Yeah. With the river here and everything, the way everything's cut out. I mean, it's awesome up here. This is so beautiful. we're just, um, you know, for reference, we're just south of Omaha a little ways, uh, but very close to the Missouri River. So that's kind of what creates that topography. But a lot of guys, you know, farming around here, obviously we work with a lot of folks that farm around here. Um, you know, most everything's terraced. It's pretty hilly for the most part. Sure. We don't have a lot of flat stuff other than just like some low low ground. Does that all change if you get 20 miles west? Oh, you man. go west. Yeah. yeah. How far do you think you have to go? Probably not not, not too, too far, far, really. Not yeah. too far. And uh, I grew up in northeast Nebraska, so on your way up to Minnesota there. Um, and our farm is right between the Missouri River to the north and seven miles to the south, the Niobrara River. So it's very hilly like it is right here in southeast Nebraska. And I never understood people growing up saying that Nebraska's flat and it's so boring. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. we, the most of our farm, we can't even put it up into production. We got to uh, lease it out or, or run cattle on it sure, because uh, of how up and down it is. Uh, but, man, once you take one trip across I-80, across Nebraska, yeah, it's pretty flat, and I get it. Yeah, it changes <laughs> right? a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when you get out west, um, like you said, it does get a lot flatter, and then you start getting into some of those areas where you couldn't even farm out there if you wanted to. No, it's basically desert area, the sand hills, and we'll go back to that. I mean, without that irrigation coming out of the Ogallala Aquifer, uh, it is, it's not. It's not habitable. It's not. It's definitely not farmable, but uh, we've been able to make it that way through irrigation and, you know, coming up with a, a chemical regimen, fertilizer, this, that. Do the sand hills, do they run cattle out in the sand hills, or what do they do with that land? It's some of the best cattle running ground in the world is what I'm told. Really? Uh, and it's because that, that grass, blue stem and the other natives there, they're so, um, well, they're geared for buffalo. I mean, that's what used to sustain right. the buffalo out there. And so it grows fast, it regenerates in a hurry, and it's high in nutrients. Uh, so if you can get your hands on, you know, some some acres out there uh, that has a good stand of that natural prairie grass, well, you got something going. Uh, and that's what you want to put some cattle on. And there are more and more buffalo operations popping up out yes. there. We've been to a few of them. We went out and helped a couple of those guys a few months back and was putting up fence. They were running around with a, a post hole digger on a skid steer. And, uh, I mean, you get six, eight inches down, and you're in straight rock yeah. and sand. And those guys are spoiled. You know, those post hole diggers on a, <laughs> you know, like that. Oh, my God. I mean, Well, when you got to do 
25 <laughs> miles of fencing, you got to have something. <laughs> for bison. Yeah, for yeah, bison. I, I wouldn't want to be out there hand digging those. No, uh-uh, no. So uh, being in Nebraska as well, you mentioned cattle. Obviously, we have a lot of cattle here. We got some of the best steak in the country. We also have... What I you, had one last night. Yeah. It was yeah, awesome. For sure. Uh, and that's what I was about to get at. So you guys got to put a little something special in your mouth last night. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yep. I believe it was bovine testicles. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and honestly, it wasn't that bad. So I'm not really sure why my wife complained so much. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have cattle? <laughs> oh. Steers. <laughs> I, I was just excited to see that they're sliced and deep fried. Yeah. Like I, I, ex- I envisioned in my head that it's going to be... Um, Sort of a small potato-ish looking object. Yeah, that like I a, would bite into, like a robin egg or something. Like, yeah, yeah. I, maybe. That's what I fully expected. And then they came out. I'm like, what? They're not. It's not even round. Like it's. It's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I could have done it otherwise. Yeah. It would have been a. I don't know. Yeah. I'm envisioning a texture thing. Yeah, yeah like a mushroom that bursts when you bite into it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I. That's what I thought we were getting into. That it was going to spill down your chin and <laughs> yeah. stuff. Yeah. Let's not make it too sexy, Ben. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about Rocky Mountain oysters, here, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So we went out to uh, good clarification. We went out to Round the Bend um, and got to meet up with TJ, pretty cool dude. Yep. Hopefully, we'll have him on the podcast as well. I was talking to him about that this morning. Um, owns owns that that uh, steakhouse. I don't, and they're kind of getting like I don't know, maybe regionally known, or I don't know. They're they're getting pretty big as far as. Well, the way he talked and like just the way the place looks, I mean, it was way bigger than I thought it was when mm-hmm. we walk in there and the, like the property's big. And I mean, it sounds like it's kind of like it's the hot spot. It's yeah. funny because they're really in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a destination. It, it really is. And I've met a lot of people that are coming in from Lincoln or Omaha, and that's the place that we just want to meet in the middle, like you say. It's mm-hmm. out in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, whether you're in this city or that city in the state of Nebraska, it's just a great meeting point. And it is. It's something different. And it, it's pretty fun. Yeah. Um, and admittedly, I mean, I've lived here almost my whole life, grew up here. I've been there a number of times. I've never had nuts in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> TJ but, wasn't going to let us get out of no, there without it last night. No. But we ate them. never been to that testicle festival. No. No, they have that every there. year. I have not because it always lines up with our uh, yearly family fishing trip. Like mm-hmm. every year we, we – uh, uh, head on up to Canada to do some fishing. It's over the testicle festival, and I'm glad you brought that up, Morgan, because they they do such a terrific job of having an event, and then like year round, you hear about the testicle festival. It rhymes the whole nine yards. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, you hear about that all the time in marketing. You got to have an event. You got to draw people there, or just have something fun, something zany that someone can get a T-shirt from. And man, do they do it! I mean, he said yeah. three to four thousand people. And yeah. was it 11,000 pounds of yeah. testicles yeah. they sell over that weekend? Now, does that include <clears throat> the sack? Or is that just... <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure at what point they measure. How do you, yeah, how do you is weigh Is that dry them? weight or wet? <laughs> <laughs> Bringing the I farming into it. Hanging <laughs> weight. <laughs> <laughs> but didn't he, didn't TJ send you a t-shirt and that's how you heard oh, about that? Yeah, so he okay. sent he sent it to Zach. Um, oh, we got a whole that. Oh, we got okay. a whole box of testicle festival t-shirts after the thing was done a couple of years ago and it said like share these with the pipe layer. Right. So then so yeah, so that's how we and then tagged in a few things and we just we've just we've been talking a couple of years probably. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> uh back and forth and we've gotten it on pretty good over social media and they're and, spunky t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spunky. Spunky. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was I was pleasantly surprised. They're pretty decent, but you, I mean, you bread anything like that, I guess you about could eat it. You slice it thin enough so that it's got <laughs> yeah. more breading on it. Yeah, yeah, they're I, very crunchy. That's how the Indians were able to eat the whole buffalo. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, they're their fry daddy that they drop it in. Slice it and yeah. fry it. They happen yep. to be out of the turkey nuts, so we didn't get to try any of those. But yeah, uh, he said those are ball form. Um, oh, really? That's what he said. They're more like they'll stay like, intact, like a bunch of deep fried peanut M and M's. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know turkeys had balls? I never even realized that. Well, they would have to, wouldn't they? I guess. I, I bet they're inside. Does everything that's male have balls? I, I, don't, I would assume. Some some form of them. Yeah. Right? I, I guess, yeah. I don't really know. 
I've, I've never seen hanging out. But yeah. I've yeah, I mean we like we go to Andy's a big turkey hunter. I mean he would probably know and, and we've been a few times, but I've I mean and I've watched thousands of turkeys walk around the field. I've never seen any hairy danglers. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, just, all, I they're, mean, they're up. They're yeah, inside, just, right? Yeah, yeah, just like a duck or whatever. I mean, when you see a Canadian goose flying, you know, in V formation, you don't see half of them with balls. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Just <laughs> in the wind. Somebody make you that a meme. Boy, boy, girl, boy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You really want to avoid the the low flying tree branch. <laughs> <laughs> no one going over fences. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> no, no, I, I can think about that. I can remember uh, the first time I was introduced. A uh, small little cafe up in northeast Nebraska to Rocky Mountain oysters, and it was just like what you guys are talking about. You know, sliced kind of thin and fried. And I knew something was up. I'm like, Dad, what are these? He goes, Oh, they're just, uh, they're just crispies, just just cr- crispy food. <laughs> Come on, oh okay, like fries? Oh yeah, yeah, like fries, yeah, fries. You know, tail off. Uh, so I, you know, I'd eat, I ate three or four. My br- little brother ate three or four, and then finally, you know, Mom couldn't stand it. She's like, Those are testicles. <laughs> yeah, you know? you know, she, you know, she didn't have any. I did notice that. Um, that but, you got to see. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, obviously, back in the day, sometime. <laughs> they, uh, they, they, they tasted like uh, um, chicken fried steak. Is that what you call that? Yeah. The breaded. Yeah. That's what yeah. they tasted. Yeah. Didn't you call it country fried steak? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think we call it country. I think in Minnesota. Country. Yeah. I, I actually thought maybe they were two different things. Oh, really? Yeah, so I Maybe just get whichever are. one is on the menu. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the That's place I go to for breakfast, it says country fried steak. Yeah. That's one of those 12 terms. We could figure out where you're from. Yeah. Between yeah. that and crayfish. Mm-hmm. Right. We, uh, we lived in Tennessee, and that was the only place that I'd ever been that they called it country fried. So I thought it was a southern thing. But apparently it passes the Midwest and then jumps back up north. Apparently. Because around here, it's chicken fried, right? Isn't that what yeah, you Yeah, chicken yeah. fried steak, man. Yeah. yeah. Do you have cracker barrels around here? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what uh, is it on that menu? I've never looked, but I bet it's country fried. If you have an interstate, you have a cracker barrel. There is no escaping. We we don't. <laughs> the, I think the closest one to us is like, uh, there might be one in Rochester. Oh, is there? At least a couple hundred miles south of us. Yeah. I don't we know did. that I'd really seen one before until uh, we were in Arkansas but, last week. Yeah, then you get by them every 10 miles. Did you eat at one? I've eaten at a few. They're pretty good. Yeah. When I was a kid, we didn't have them in Nebraska when we were younger. I mean, and you were up in northeast Nebraska, yeah. so you definitely didn't have them there. Our closest McDonald's was then and is now 40, 40 45 minutes away from our farm. Yeah. yeah. So I was, when I was a kid, um, my grandparents used to take us down to Georgia every summer um, just to visit family and stay there for a few weeks or whatever. And we'd always hit the Cracker Barrel on the way. And I think the closest one might have been Kansas City ish. But we would we would take a trip just to Cracker Barrel for a couple hours and come back because I like the place so much. <laughs> it's an experience. I'll give it yeah. that. Yeah, like, I don't like, know that they're quite that good. <laughs> I thought it was when I was little. <laughs> um, maybe you were a little deprived or what? No, you I, like the store probably. Yeah, probably. And the little games that you play on the uh, table with the little uh, tees, the golf tees on them, and you figure out if you're yeah. dumb or stu- or smart or whatever it says. I've only been to one a couple of times, and the first time I ever went was when I was in college. And I just remember thinking, "So what is this? Is it, I thought it was a restaurant, but there's more mm-hmm. going. Mm-hmm. There's more going on there. <laughs> it's a Cracker Barrel. Yeah. It's a thing in and of itself. Yep. The oh. young entrepreneur in me was very <laughs> fascinated. They were selling all kinds of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and you always left yeah. with something. Right. Well, they make you walk through the gift yeah. shop. Yeah. And you're when you're sitting there waiting for a half an hour for your table or whatever, you're just checking out all these little. Mom, this Chachkis. parrot says my name back to me. All I got to do is say it. And it says it back. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty fun. So uh, you guys have a podcast, um, the uh, Off the Husk. Yep. We've made some shirts for that one. How's that going for you guys? Uh, it's going good. We need to get more consistent with it. Yeah. But either way, we're having fun. Everybody I talk to who listens to it really enjoys it. I enjoy it. I think it's great. Um, TJ last night, he he probably could have quoted stuff from yeah, it. Yeah, he clearly listens to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he pays more attention to it than I ever have. Yeah, <laughs> folks definitely need to check that out because it's very entertaining. Um, and we, one time I came up and saw you guys, and we um did an, an interview about Farm Focused, and kind of part of what you know has you guys down here right now is the merchandising side of stuff that we do. So, for folks to really understand how that works, I think we 
um, kind of went in depth on your guys' podcast and had a great explanation. So folks can go check that out. But um, the merchandise side of stuff, how how does that work for you guys? You know, is it is it something that you enjoy doing? How is it? You know, what's it look like specifically with off the husk or with everything? Everything. Yep. Well, like I've I've mentioned before, like when when we started, we had people saying, "Hey, you should make T-shirts, you should make hats, whatever." And and for a year, six months at least, I kind of just ignored it because to me that sounded like way too much work. I yeah. didn't want to deal with talking to suppliers and figuring out who's going to print this, how do I get this embroidered? Like who? I don't even I don't know how to do the artwork. I don't know how to do any of that. Mm-hmm. And then I really don't want to take, you know, a thousand emails. Yeah. And have to figure out how to get all these addresses printed out and then box them up. And I just, I did not want to deal with any of that. And then I got talking to Ben a little bit more. And I, I think that was the very beginning, right? You were, you were kind of just thinking about yeah. trying that and adding that to Farm Focused. Yeah. Yeah. We had just kind of been dabbling in it with Farm Focus, the Farm Focused brand. Right. And then you were talking about how you needed some help. And we were like, oh, it seems like it wouldn't be that big of a deal. It did end up yeah. being a big deal. <laughs> yeah. But... It ended up being yeah. a bigger deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. and on that, you know, like, what if your logo making ability sucks? What if you think you're doing all this great marketing and you're actually projecting some out there that just turns everybody off to your brand? Yeah. I mean, if if it's not your wheelhouse, you got to find help or people that are going to get you to where you want to be. Or yeah. or putting out a terrible product. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And being being able to handle uh, customer service. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's where I mean, you guys do a great job of that, and and uh, you know, we don't really have to hassle with all that. Like you talked about the product, I mean, is is uh, first and foremost the most important that it's a good when they receive it's good quality product, something they're proud to wear. But something that is almost equally important is that experience that those folks get because it's representing your brand. I mean, it's essentially you. If we screw up, they th- really think more about you than they do us. Sure. Yep. Or sometimes they think that farm focused is us, and yes. they call here <laughs> right. to talk about fertilizer <laughs> yeah. prices. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that does happen. <laughs> But that's been that's been a ton of fun. So obviously, you know, by now, folks that are listening to this podcast know that uh, we own Farm Focus. We're affiliated with that here. Um, but it's it's been great. I mean, I can't thank you guys enough for the uh, you know trust that you put in us. It's created a business that we never really thought about doing, and it's been very rewarding and fun. So it's cool. Not so much different from starting a YouTube channel as a hobby, and the next thing you know, it's what you do. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what I think ha- brings a lot of symmetry together, like a lot of things working together here, your mission statement is to educate people on what's going on out on the farm. And so if you sell a hat or a T-shirt with your logo on it and your message, basically, that's a conversation starter for somebody going to a fair or somebody going to a basketball game. What is that? Millennial farmer. What is that? OK, now what you're trying to do, your core goal, your mission statement is happening through the apparel, you know, that, that Farm Focused is helping you out with. So, like, it's just really cool when you see different things coming together like that, and it, it's all working towards the same goal. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the best way to make it work. Yeah. You know, like I said, I don't want to deal with all the shipping and the printing and all that, and that's what Ben's for. So now you we guys deal with figured it. it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> well... Uh, I don't think we have a whole lot more time. You got anything else you wanted to ask Andy or, or go through? I feel like I drilled him quite a bit on a few different topics. Maybe for another time we can get into tiling, you know. <laughs> really get into that. It would be, That sure. would be a good conversation to do a whole. Yeah, it would. A whole podcast on. Um, so to kind of wrap up here, we've got, so obviously folks can't see what, what we've got going on here, but we'll just kind of explain it. This, this table that we work off of, my buddy built, uh, pretty cool setup. And in the center here, we have a flag, um, wooden flag, by the Charred Chisel guys. So they brought that to us. And it opens up to a secret compartment. Get that open. It's not a secret anymore. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. So in here, we've got a uh, this company that we just started working with called uh, Handlebend. So it's handlebend.com. It's some couple of guys in uh, Nebraska, and they got a few other folks that work with them. But they make these cool copper... Um, cups, shot glasses, straws, all kinds of things. So uh, we just want to give a shout out to those guys for hooking us up with these things, custom logoed. Maybe some things that you see on the Farm Focus website uh, someday soon with your guys' logos on it. Do they make a copper straw? Yes. Cool. Yep. Cool. Yep. All the stuff that they make is out of copper. Um, 
And also, um, thanks to those guys as well, Andy, you can grab that that box. And we need to get a second one. Um, yeah, this was just kind of the one we started with. But this is just like a little gift set um, for you guys for coming on. So we appreciate that. We'll get another one sent up your way. So that's for you guys to take from the Handle Bend boys. Cool. Thank you. You know, and to help people put that together, a picture in their mind, you basically have a little speakeasy here in the middle of your table. It's concealing <laughs> yeah. some bourbon. we got a little vodka in there. Yep. And, of course, the Handle Bend uh, copper cups here that a lot of people like to use for Moscow mules and, and other craft style drinks. Yeah, and these ones that we had had them make for us are more of like a um, uh, like a whiskey tumbler. Hmm. Um, and I think that's probably what we'll get going forward. But also inside here, a little something from Cooper's Chase. We had, we yeah. had him on. Yeah, uh, Doug on. A couple times ago. Yep. He's uh, here in Nebraska as well. Makes this stuff with local local grains. Um yeah, you want to talk about an entrepreneur. I yeah, mean, Doug yeah, Trainer, you know. Yep. So so he distills that close to here? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I mean, how how far are we, Andy? Maybe an West hour point, West yeah. Point hour out of from where we are here. Yep, and he uses grain from the local elevators to distill this vodka sure. and, and this bourbon. So mm-hmm. I mean, that's yep, pretty You want to talk stuff. about just supporting your local farmer, uh, water and whiskey, right? Right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So what we're going to do here is we're going to try this because well, there we go. That's what we do. I love these handle bin. Even these small little like tumbler shot glasses, they're heavy. And it reminds me of that scene in uh, Jurassic Park. Is it heavy? Yes. Then they're expensive. Put it back. <laughs> <laughs> Put it back. All right, what do you boys want? You want bourbon or vodka? Uh, bourbon. bourbon. Yeah, I'm going bourbon. That's right. That's the route, route I'd go to. Let's give you a little something because you got a you got a trip to make. <laughs> right. Is this going to be like yesterday's podcast? Like as soon as it hits the lips, like your whole body just gets warm and you're just like, oh, no. And then we cut it, go off air, and, you know, <laughs> continue. <laughs> Sit here for the next 19 hours. <laughs> Grab me one more of those cups over there. There we go. Morgan, you want anything? Uh, nah, I'm good. Do, do, you, do you want mine? <laughs> <laughs> well, boys, I think that's about all we have. Again, appreciate you coming. Um, close it out with a with a drink and a toast. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. It's pretty yeah. good, man. Yeah. 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 I don't drink a ton of bourbon, but I really do like that one. It's pretty smooth. It yeah. really is. They had uh, yeah, on yesterday's show. Can I talk about other other alcohols? Absolutely. Yeah. They had a. Black velvet toasted caramel. Have you tried that? Mm-hmm. Ooh, that that, was, that was pretty good. That sounds good. They also had an apple one. I don't recommend that one. Really? But the toasted caramel was awesome. Let's see, like apple pucker. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's what it was like. <clears throat> well, but it was a whiskey. Kind of. or, it was a yeah, it was a, apple flavored whiskey. It was a uh, uh, black velvet. Okay. Yeah. I'm not above above the blends or the flavors. So sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's gotten really popular. Well, guys, again, we appreciate it. Uh, hope you have a safe trip back home. Thanks for coming to town. It's always good to see you guys. Yeah, thank yeah. you guys. Thanks. All right. We out? We're out. All right. See you guys.